damn it, how long have we been doing this show? The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 308. It is SummerSlam week of 2022. I'm Ethan. I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. <laughs> we have so much and uh, and so much we cannot talk about because we have so much to talk about <laughs> more than perhaps ever before. I feel like we've said that a lot the past year or so. I feel like about a year ago, the punk news broke. And I feel like every other week since then, we've had a week where we're like, yeah, this is the most <laughs> this is the most newsworthy week we've ever had. Well, it doesn't get much more new- newsworthy than uh, than this one, I guess. Yeah. So uh, I went out of town last weekend and uh, I didn't take my computer with me, so I couldn't do any work. And uh, Friday turns out they dropped the uh, WWE drops the biggest non Chris Benoit news story uh, in in WWE in my lifetime. Vince McMahon retired. Will come out later. It was a resignation and not just a straight retirement. But Vince McMahon allegedly no longer running. WWE Stephanie McMahon and Nick Khan new co CEOs. I'm sure Nick is running the business and Stephanie is there to be the, the public face of the business. Triple H back in his perch as executive vice president of talent relations. He takes over the old Johnny Ace job and Triple H also in charge of creative. So People have pointed out Vince McMahon still controls like 80% of the voting shares in the company and he did not divest himself. So when it comes to actual business decisions about the company and voting on a sale or things of that nature, Vince McMahon still has the lion's share of the um, executive power in the company, but no longer a title, no longer there at TV every week after sexual misconduct charges and hush money payouts. And I'm not sure quite what to make of this. It's one of those things where Vince McMahon has been running this company since before I was born. And we're now told he is no longer running this company and people, it's not even like the, this is a work mindset. It's a, I have literally never seen, a WWE slash F not run by Vince McMahon. And so I physically am not capable of believing it until I see it (laughs) because we were told our whole lives, this guy was just going to work till he dropped dead. And now he's been forced out of his own company. It would seem so much to talk about within this story. (laughs) Yeah. It's uh, it's hard to find like an entry point for this because yeah you can you can look at the the historical you know what is vince's legacy i think it's a little soon to look at that side of things he isn't dead he's just not running the company but that in and of itself as you pointed out has never happened before in our lifetimes um so that in and of itself is a huge deal there's the side of the new people being put in charge and what their vision may be to me that you know will i think it's going to be hard to analyze that until i don't know i feel like in 6 months <laughs> we'll be able to tell and maybe sooner but i feel like it, you know when we're doing like our year wrap up shows you know we'll be able to look back to this time and and see if there was like a real stark change or if it was just more minor things that got tweaked as as paul levex's uh, regime took over on the tv and creative side And then, yeah, you have you have the (laughs) you have the, you know, the scandal, which, you know, as of now, there's a you know, the the company in their statements gave themselves a little bit of legal wiggle room that this could not be all that there is. Obviously, the 14.6 million number was already bigger than the previous number we had heard by a couple of million dollars. And uh, there's also, you know. Uh, things because the co- if I understand this correctly, and really you should just go to WrestleNomics if you want to actually understand, <laughs> have someone intelligent uh, about like the business side of this explain this to you. But because the business, because WWE directly was involved and benefited from the payments he made, they were they should have been still reported as uh, company expenses, despite the fact that Vince 
supposedly paid them all out of his own pocket. And, and so that has also caused, caused them to have to like re re release every financial statement for like the last two years. (laughs) So it's just, there's so much on the corporate side of this that feels dense and sort of impenetrable with, as you mentioned, Nick Khan running the company and Stephanie being, uh, you know, being his, his co-CEO and likely sort of the public face. And then you have, you have Hunter in a dual role as the head of creative and the, uh, the talent relations guy. That is interesting to me because I imagine it can be hard. And I think I actually saw it might've been Fightful had, had had some comments from WWE people who weren't happy with the idea of Pritchard being in that dual role because they felt like, Hey, if this guy's booking you on television every week and you ask for time off and that could affect his creative plans, is he going to give it to you? Uh, And so I wonder how those same people feel now that Paul is the one in those dual roles. There's just, yeah, there's so much into this and it feels nigh impenetrable uh, at this time uh, to, to really analyze what this will mean until we get a little bit of distance from it and, and figure it out. And we see what other reporting might be done. There's still this, (laughs) this phantom real sports with Bryant Gumbel. Did you know that show was still on the air? Mm, Vaguely. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. I think I, I mean, I, I, I use somebody's HBO max and I, I think I maybe have seen the ad for it, but when I heard there was a real sports with Bryant Gumbel report coming up on fans, I was like, huh, well, that's a name that you haven't heard. And <laughs> it hasn't been relevant in like 20 years. Good for them. <laughs> Good for them for still being on the air. But yeah, it just, this, this whole thing is while it's the biggest story of all time, I like, I, I don't know what Avenue you take to analyze this. Do you look at the historical impact of Vince on the business first? Do you look at how the, corporate culture could change with Vince gone. I know there's a lot of, you know, the idea that the stock price went up when it was announced and the, the, the analyzation there was that with Vince gone, Wall Street at least believes that it's more likely that the company could be sold now, though I don't, I don't think there's been any like word that they're actively looking. Um, so yeah, like there's, there's a whole corporate side of this that's, that's fascinating. And then there's the the, just the regular old TV side and not to mention the interpersonal dynamics of Hunter, who was, you know, had a, was basically fired from his NXT role was had a, had a, you know, heart attack and was near death and then was back in like a corner office in the basement at Stanford (laughs) uh, running tryouts for, for all the, you know, the college athletes they're signing and Stephanie who, uh, you know, voluntarily left the company and then was buried on her way out. And now they are once again, the, the not the, not the heir parents. They're, they're the heirs now. It's the damnedest thing, man. Just, yeah, just three months ago, Triple H was uh, retiring the ring at WrestleMania. Stephanie McMahon was on TV with no engagement ring. Mm-hmm. Hey, she did tweet Triple H uh, happy birthday the other day. Oh, there you go. That was civil of her. So everything's fine. <laughs> did you, I don't, this, is, this doesn't fit anywhere, but did, did you see the, the, the item that Fightful reported about Vince McMahon claiming that after he screwed up the Royal Rumble, Shane McMahon would never get another pop in his company as long as he lived? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he hates Shane so much. <laughs> He hates um, Shane. How dare he screw up the Royal Rumble? <laughs> he loved being in a sexual misconduct scandal. Right. No one has ever had more fun being in a scandal. <laughs> That's right, but not as much. He did not love that as much as he hated his own son. Correct. Yeah. So we got the first television show of the uh, new creative era last Friday. Brock Lesnar walked out. Brock Lesnar came back. There definitely seems to be this undercurrent of, well, they definitely want you to think that they, the Austin Theory push is not going to continue because <laughs> they have treated him like a punching bag on SmackDown and Raw, the first two shows of the Triple H creative era. On the other hand, 
he has still been all over these shows. Mm -hmm. So it it feels like very much a, a, I don't want to say swerve, but feels like maybe you can't really uh, divine what their true intentions are as far as uh, Austin Theory going forward, simply based on the first two shows. But aside from a Monday Night Raw that had a lot of wrestling on it, and had uh, some blood in the main event. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's way too soon to draw any conclusions as to what to make of um, Triple H as head of creative so far. I'm not sure even what he'll be implement, what he's implemented so far. I think maybe we start judging that after this weekend, SummerSlam. What do you think? Yeah, and, and we can get to that as we tackle the whole SummerSlam card, but the biggest creative shakeup so far seems to be the decision to delay the Rollins and Riddle match until the following month's stadium show. Other than that, it was pretty much a business as usual Raw, other than maybe more more in ring <laughs> than we are uh, than we have seen on some recent episodes of television. But yeah, other than that, felt like a pretty standard episode. You know, you could, you know there's a little less, maybe it feels like the announcers are a little looser and a little less, you know, worried that any word they say could be, you know, the fixated on and, and they'll get yelled at by an insane old man over it. But yeah, other than that, it was, it was pretty much business as usual for, for a Monday night raw go home show. Well, one match that they pulled from SummerSlam was Seth Rollins versus riddle. And instead it looks like they're shooting an angle with, Seth Rollins and Triple H on social media where they could be setting up a new opponent for Rollins. And I don't think I'm telling tales out of school here that um, I think a lot of people think Johnny Gargano is going to wrestle Seth Rollins at SummerSlam now. That would be, uh, yeah, that would be, (laughs) you know, and there was, this would be the time, right? For, for that guy to come back. He's been very smart, by the way. Gargano has because with all the appearances and everything he's made he has not appeared in front of like a live crowd in a wrestling ring at all and that so he has saved that for a big moment and hey this would be a good good way and a good marking of the territory yep for, very much for the new regime to for Paul to bring one of his guys back that was kind of I don't want to say forced out because they did offer him a contract to stay but um Yeah, obviously not a guy who was looking, whose prospects looked particularly bright um, other than as a tackling dummy for, you know, the forehead guy and the other and the Creed brothers and whoever down at NXT. So, yeah, that would be a a big kind of marking of the territory for him. And a lot of Hunter's other guys uh, aren't free to come back anytime soon. So. Johnny would be the one you would think if you were trying to make a big, uh, big statement that, Hey, this is a new era and, and Paul's guys are coming in. Yep. Yep. Let me think that. All right. We can run down the uh, SummerSlam card here. Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar in a last man standing match for the universal championship. I don't see Brock Lesnar taking the title here. No, I mean, it would be, <laughs> it would be, so, it would be funny. I think if after, a 7,000 day reign as champion Roman just ended up losing it to Brock. That would be funny. Um, but no, I mean, the, I think they even feel like this isn't that exciting of a match. Like they haven't really, they didn't do like the big brawl this time with, with Brock and Roman or anything like, and I mean, they did the promos, but it was pretty standard. Like, you know, Paul Heyman, the tribal chief, the catchphrase and, and Roman's going to be the champion after SummerSlam and and Brock. I assume Brock has cut one promo that I've probably forgotten by now since he's been back, but he's mostly just kind of been, I mean, he came out and beat the tar out of theory last week. And then, uh, you know, that, that, yeah, just doesn't feel very exciting. It feels like the hook for this that they have set up is, is theory going to cash in and, on whoever wins and i think whoever wins is roman so yeah maybe maybe roman wins and then theory cashes in and loses i don't know yeah well i definitely have gotten the 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 vibe that he's cashing in and losing whenever he does cash in (laughs) which you know kills the guy's career but 
I, oh well. Yeah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> to a nicer guy, it couldn't happen. La la. Bobby Lashley is wrestling theory for the United States Championship on this show. His theory is just up and down every single show. The Usos and the Street Profits with Jeff Jarrett as the guest referee. <laughs> Naturally, for the for the uh, undisputed tag team titles, Jeff running, Jarrett running a stadium show in Nashville. He needed to bring in the hometown boy to sell some tickets, brother. Jeff Jeff Jarrett, maybe in the most tenuous position he's been in in <laughs> I don't know days at least. Now that he has this role as an executive in WWE and the regime that was in charge of uh, giving him that executive position suddenly perhaps falling out of favor. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Like, I don't remember any like Jarrett coming up against the click stories, but I've never gotten the impression that I mean, he certainly wasn't a, a Paul guy like with Jarrett and, and the rest of those TNA guys came in. It didn't feel like that was a Levesque decision. He's very much a Bruce guy, though. Mm-hmm. And Bruce and Steph. Bruce is not a Stephanie guy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I'm just thinking that maybe Jeff is not the most popular guy there. (laughs) But he is Uh, still like two scandals away from running the company at this point. So it's true. It's true. Jeff and Jerry, both Jarrett's just uh, just one. (laughs) One scandal away from running the World Wrestling Federation decades apart. Uh, Liv Morgan versus Ronda Rousey for the SmackDown Women's Championship. Sure doesn't feel like the time to beat Liv, who just won the title. Sure doesn't feel like Ronda Rousey should be doing a bunch of jobs for Liv Morgan. This feels like we've booked ourselves into a corner here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you you could do, a, you know, you could do the, like a roll up flash pin, the Triple H finish. There's another way to tell Paul's in charge. Does Ronda Rousey get pinned, immediately jump up and laugh it off? That would be it, which she kind of did at at the previous show now that I think about it. Yes, um, could be. But uh, yeah, I mean, Charlotte's like a healthy scratch to come back soon, right? So, you know, you could always have her just run in and cause a DQ and then you set up a three-way for next month or whatever. Yep. Uh, Pat McAfee versus Happy Corbin. Um, this will probably over-deliver as most Pat McAfee things seem to. Yeah, people people love the guy, and he's he's good in this role. And it, like they had footage of like of of like that they were roommates when they were both briefly on the Colts together, and things like that. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a fine little feud. And yes, I think people will be into this in the same way they were very into Pat's match at Mania. The Mysterios will be wrestling the Judgment Day. Now, here's one little thing that. That, uh, that happened on Monday Night Raw. So Rhea Ripley came back and attacked Rey Mysterio, mm-hmm. which, was, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but they had a, like a, a stare down between Rey's um, uncomfortably young daughter, Aaliyah, and Rhea Ripley on television. And if it's one, it was one of those things where if you don't know, you would think, well, are these two going to have a match? But if you do know, mm-hmm. it's that... Aaliyah was linked with Buddy Murphy on screen and Rhea Ripley is now dating Buddy Murphy off screen. And so they were supposed to be doing this weird, I don't know, work the internet kind of thing. And it's like, it's not like at a level of a Russo thing because they didn't like, you know, or Bischoff talking about uh, uh, Sid's trying to stab <laughs> Arn with scissors or something yeah. and not getting a pop. But it was a little bit of a, huh. They did this, they referenced this weird mix of real life and storyline thing, but never really called attention to it. But what percentage of the audience even noticed this? I don't know. Anyway, the Mysterios are wrestling the Judgment Day, and uh, I assume uh, Edge is going to come back here with, uh, imagine if you're Edge and you cut your hair off for this angle. (laughs) He didn't want to be spooky. Or at least that was the word at the time. Although all of his vignettes to come back were so spooky that people thought it was a Bray Wyatt vignette at first. Yeah. So I don't know. I guess he's. I don't. I don't know. Again, maybe without Vince, spooky doesn't have to mean teleports and shoots lightning. You know, you could just be like an angry guy. I guess. 
you don't you don't have to do you don't have to lean so hard into the the hocus pocus papa shango side of uh, which you know kind of all spooky characters end up being on uh, on Vince McMahon shows but yeah I mean I would I would think that Finn and and Priest need to win here if they're going to be feuding with Edge coming back so and you know what do they love more There's, they've spent 20 years doing it as they remind us on Monday they love beating Rey Mysterio so uh yes. and I don't know that that's going to change with this uh with this new regime either Hey, he did get to win his 20th anniversary match. Now, they did beat him down backstage twice (laughs) in consecutive segments after he got the big win. Mm -hmm. But he got to cut a nice promo, and he got to win. That's fair. That is an improvement. And (laughs) his his son did not turn on him and beat him up during his his thank you speech. So there is that. His wife did not kick him low. (laughs) Ugh. Logan Paul and The Miz are going to have a singles match. Logan Paul has been positioned as the babyface question mark in this feud. Um, I guess that was part of the deal. I don't know. I think Logan Paul is popular with an audience. I'm not sure it's the audience that watches WWE. And p- because they've he's been presented as the babyface in these uh, angles here with The Miz, the crowd isn't like out and out booing him or crapping on the on on his angles and stuff they kind of just sit there in some silence <laughs> and uh the miz is like aligned with champa now it's like there's this i don't know none of this is working for me but i don't know they they seem very impressed with themselves that they have logan paul so good for them i guess <laughs> Yeah, like I, yeah, it's one of those things where I imagine the people that follow him and like him would view content from WWE. They'll watch YouTube or TikTok clips of it or Instagram or whatever. I don't think they're going to be, you know, buying a ticket to see a WWE show or or cable television, right? (laughs) Or or subscribing to Peacock for for his match, but I don't. And then so on, and then if they do, like the crowd's probably going to cheer the Miz and boo him. And it's like, is that fun if you're a fan of Logan Paul to watch him get booed or apathetically not cheered? I don't know. I don't know what that means. Maybe yeah, maybe the no- maybe the novelty is just hey, it's it's this guy from the other thing, and he's he's doing a wrestling match. But again, we've already seen him do a wrestling match. He was fine. <laughs> um in the in the tag but yeah I, you know good luck but i bet people will cheer them is they very much have tried to uh, make make uh, the they're begging the crowd every week to chant about the Miz's testicles mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um it's certainly a choice and the crowd kind of goes along with it but eh, i don't know it's it, none of this works just none of it works. Um, and then the uh, the the main event of this show, really, Bianca Belair versus Becky Lynch. We can. I want to talk about the Becky Lynch, Kevin Dunn stuff here in a second. Mm-hmm. But uh, Bianca Belair and Becky Lynch, they did a short angle on Raw, which really stands out, given that you have a three hour show, and like, and Theory was on screen for like the first sixty minutes entirely <laughs> of the show. And they gave a Bianca Belair, Becky Lynch angle, like 45 seconds. And yet at the same time, maybe they feel like we have been doing this to death in some form or fashion for nearly 12 full months at this point. Mm -hmm. And maybe less is more. (laughs) And so in that sense, the, these two getting like 45 seconds for their, their angle. I, I don't know. I didn't hate it. Um, but uh, these two had a really great match at WrestleMania, and I'm sure they'll have a great match at SummerSlam. Yeah, they always seem to deliver in the big match, uh, the big you know pay per view stadium match. Bianca has a good track record in these matches, and I bet he does too for the most part. So yeah, I think this will be this will be good, even if it's a match that we've seen a lot. So I want to touch on the story. It was like some weird source. It was a uh, like a source that uh, some news web a wrestling news website that I'd never heard of before, like broke this story uh, last uh, this past weekend about how Kevin Dunn had been disparaging to Becky Lynch and basically said that she was not hot. 
you have to be hot to be a champion in WWE that he had derailed pushes for women before who he did not find attractive and that he had uh, made some sort of remark about the fact that uh, she needed to find a, a set of breasts or something like that in order to uh, to be a champion in WWE. And Becky kind of half asked, responded, um, subtweeted the report, basically confirming it, <laughs> mm-hmm. saying like, you know, I, I didn't get where I am because of my looks i get where i am because i work harder than everybody and all all this stuff all of that is true but first of all it's like not thinking back he went just hot enough to be uh, a, a star of something it's like okay whatever but but they almost didn't they did everything they could not to make their second biggest star of like the last 10 years mm-hmm. because of kevin dunn like nothing should shock me at this point, and I wasn't shocked by this. It's just it's incredible if you sit here and think about it and think about how Kevin Dunn not thinking someone is hot oh, almost like cost this company a lot of money. It's it's so bad. It's so bad. Yeah, I thought that I thought that was funny. I think there was a note. Apparently, Freddie Prince Jr. has a wrestling podcast. Yes. And I saw him kind of I guess corroborate this story a little bit in the sense of like, yeah, you could, you could come up with a pitch for, for, you know, you could be pitching for something for a woman for 20 minutes. And then Kevin Dunn would say, yeah, I just don't think she's hot enough. And that would be the end of it. And there'd be no further (laughs) movement on that. So, yep. uh, Yeah. It's uh, I guess it's one of those open, open secrets. And obviously, you know, it's not just him. It's, it's Vince. It's I'm sure it's Pritchard. It's all of these, these old, dinosaurs of this industry but i do all yes it's all of these all of these people but yes and you touched on it briefly but i just i love any kind of talking point like this where someone who looks like becky lynch looks (laughs) has to tweet like she's an ogre (laughs) like and they do this on television like they would do this on television with bailey and other women who they clearly didn't think were hot so they would have one of the women they did think with hat was hot, call her ugly. And then right. the, and then the, the, when the baby face would stand up for themselves, they'd be like, well, I might be the most ugly woman in the world, <laughs> but I try real hard. And it always cracks me <laughs> up in a weird way. As like, as horrible as it is that you're putting these women in this position, it's like, yeah, like, I don't know. It depends on, you know, it's all subjective of who thinks what is attractive and whatever, but it's just the idea that we're like, oh yeah, Becky, like Becky Lynch is, a, is this, this hideous creature who lucked into her stardom because she can talk or whatever. It's like, what, what, what planet are these people on where you're like, nah, nah, I can't see why anyone would think she's cool or attractive mm, or interesting. No, no, that's too bad. No. <laughs> fascinating. It's fascinating to me. It really, it really is. So we'll see how the uh, how the WWE world turns here this next week. Um, this will probably be posted on a Friday and or Friday morning, Thursday night. You'll probably be probably be listening Friday morning or Friday during the day sometime. So I'm sure, like Friday afternoon at four o'clock, the next <laughs> twist in the Vince McMahon WWE scandal will will come out, and we'll have mm-hmm. to talk about it at some point. But yeah, uh, AEW Dynamite it was a television show this week. There's more belts. They did a Ring of Honor pay per view where this past weekend, where Claudio Castagnoli beat uh, Jonathan Gresham for the world title. Jonathan Gresham left. <laughs> he quit. He uh, and Tony Khan had a heated argument and he quit. He first did the job for uh, Cesaro. I don't, there are so many tentacles to everything that's going on in AEW right now. It's like, there's a battle of the belts show next week that they didn't even mention on TV this week. There's, they're building to something called quake by the lake in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. They're shooting ring of honor angles on AEW shows because ring of honor doesn't have television. They have like every episode of dynamite, since all out has been a very special episode of dynamite they've had like two weeks of uh of 
uh, Fighter Fest, and then this week is Fight for the Fallen, and it's just there is so much AEW content and Ring of Honor content, and then we have we're just five weeks away from All Out. It's it's it it never stops. <laughs> Well, I will say I'm very happy that most of the uh, the ROH stuff is being relegated to Rampage because that just makes it feel like a show I don't have to watch anymore. Sure. Um, for the most part, uh, so that's that's fine. Um, I would prefer it not be there at all. But you know, that's if if beggars could can't be choose this year, I'll take I'll take that stuff getting mostly relegated to to Rampage. It's, yeah, as far as the the pay per view, I did watch it. Um, Opener was all right. Uh, I thought the the Roosh and Dragon Lee match. Dragon Lee had a please hire me match. He sure. did. He did. He did some classic Dragon Lee things where he thought he was dead about three different times. Sounds about right. And uh, and and that was a lot of fun. And then yeah, the main event. Uh, I did not think that this Briscoe's this is this Briscoe's FDR thing was to me a classic example of. Longer doesn't always mean better. Sure. Um, we've talked about that, I think, quite a few times over the years. It was still very good. Um, but to me, it was it was probably two or three notches below their previous encounter. And a lot of that is because, uh, you know, it went almost 50 minutes and it's two out of three falls. And it was not a particularly hot crowd to begin with. Um and then on top of that, you have them going very long and the crowd doesn't really get into it until you get to that third fall anyway. So I think there was a lot working against it. But yeah, overall, I think the show was was a solid enough thing. And then I thought Dynamite this week was, f- for the most part, a really, really good show. I don't know why Tony Nice and Mark Sterling... I like Mark Sterling because I like the Major Wrestling Figure podcast and he's one of the hosts on that. Uh, I don't really care for him as a television character and i definitely don't care for tony niece as a television character um and the idea that they're challenging uh for the tag belts when you have so many other teams doesn't make any sense to me but uh yeah they're around other than that i thought i thought there was a lot of good wrestling on the show this week and i thought that that, that like i don't know 10 to 12 minutes of television time from ricky starks versus dan Housen to Ricky Starks versus Hook, to the Ricky Starks promo where he kind of turns himself babyface, to Powerhouse Hobbs turning on on Ricky Starks. Like, that was, I thought, just tremendous television. Like, when they almost never do, it's like, it's always to the back. So I, uh, even though I watched the show on tape delay, I did not know that the Hobbs turn was coming. So when they come back from break and Hobbs and Starks are still in the ring, I was like, well, that's strange. That never happens on this show. They never do follow up on this show. Right. And then they did. And it led to a really big angle. And it felt like kind of a big status quo shift for for both Starks and Hobbs, who have been regular parts of the TV for, I think, most of this year, but have been in the tag division. So it felt like a a big reset and like a, you know, something that maybe will freshen the show up a little bit. And then I thought jungle boy cut like a really good promo for a guy who has not cut a lot of promos on live television. Um, I thought he needed to bring it and he did. Uh, I wouldn't have done the Christian interruption this week. I would have just let jungle boy hit, hit back and hit his, his gasping lines about Christian's divorce and things like that. Sure. I probably left it there, but yeah, I thought that was good. And then the main event I thought was fantastic. So it's like, that's, I'm, you know, I'm a simple man when it comes to these wrestling shows. It's like you give me, you give, a, you give me a couple, uh, you know, a couple good wrestling matches and a couple of angles that I think are like really good and memorable. I'm pretty happy with that show. I'm going to nitpick them because that's what I do. Always. It's not, I don't want to be the anti AEW guy. Like, that's a terrible gimmick to have as Jim Cornette. <laughs> it's just, it's a very crowded field, is my thing. Like, like, live your dreams, honestly. But like, when Bischoff went on that train, I was like, man, that train's real full already, Eric. I'm not sure this is the best strategy for you. Now, Road Dogs like trying to lag behind and get onto it. I just, I just don't know, man. It feels like that train's pretty full. My, 
my anti AEW thing though is not the um the cornet, oh it's a bunch of flippy do wrestling <laughs> with short people or whatever. Like my thing is just the execution of of all of their stuff. Most of their stuff I find to be bad, but if there, if I were to nitpick this show, the two things it would be were uh they they did give Starks a lot of time for those segments. However, like after Hobbs turned on him and hit him with a lariat or whatever, uh, 15 seconds later, it was to the back. Like they very much rushed that. Also, powerhouse Hobb has breasts and should be wearing (laughs) and should be wearing a singlet at all times. Disagree. Including at the grocery store. He had he has he has breasts. They shouldn't be like hanging out there on television. Power lifter. He has big, powerful pectoral muscles. They're breasts. <laughs> There's a difference. I mean, by, by definition. <laughs> are they or are they not breasts? They, I, 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 you know, I didn't see us going down this road tonight. And uh, all right, continue. Continue on. I, I, I don't mean to derail you. Also, the thing that I don't like about da- Brian Danielson matches is that I'm worried for his health the entire time. (laughs) And he chose to build a match around pretending he was having a concussion. Not for the first time. (laughs) Nope. He loves loves to do that. that. Yep. Loves to do that and build matches around bumping on his head and neck. But uh, yeah, so I didn't care for those items about AEW. And I also don't think we need more championships and they're going to introduce a trios championship. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't need that on the show. Um, but it's it's it seems like it's the reason to do belts if if it's just to kind of inform a story where you want the Bucks in a permanent six man group and you give them a reason to have regular six man tags whether that's with Hangman or with Omega, um, you know it's a, it's a reason to do that is if there's a six man division I guess sure but it does again you when you have three male singles titles plus the ROH, the various ROH belts, apparently ROH has six man belts, which uh, Dalton Castle and the boys won on the, on the pay-per-view. Yes. Which I mean, very happy to see Dalton Castle and the boys securing the bag. But uh, yeah, but yeah, as far as I was like, ROH has six man belts. Who knew? Um, So yeah, you have two sets of six man belts. Theoretically, maybe I would at the very least unify those. But I don't know. I guess they want to keep it. I want to. They want to have all these belts. Some of the belts will disappear theoretically if ROH ever gets this mythical television deal. God, I hope so. <laughs> but uh, in the meantime, you're, you've got all the ROH belts, the the three men's singles titles, the tag belts, and and then the, the couple of belts the women have. So yeah, it's a it's a belt heavy show. There's no doubt about that. Yep. Yep. Powerhouse Hobbs. Breasts. <laughs> it's just I don't like. He's just a big muscular man. I don't. I I disagree. <laughs> he looks like a man who bench presses a lot of weight. That's what he looks like to me. He, he shouldn't have his shirt off on television. That's, that's all I'm saying. Uh, I went to Waterloo, Iowa, for the uh, um. Luthez George Tragos Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame induction. You watched my dog while well, uh, my wife and I went to Iowa. Mm-hmm. If you're if you're done with the wrestling, you ever if you just want to hear about modern wrestling, everyone, you can tune out now. <laughs> <laughs> it's story time, baby. Yeah. So uh, in 60 hours, we went from Baltimore, Maryland to Chicago, Illinois, to Waterloo, Iowa, to Chicago, Illinois to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, to Baltimore, Maryland, 60 hours. I would not try to do this trip in 60 hours again. Mm -hmm. Uh, However, uh, I'm glad I went to Iowa. Uh, So I, they announced that they were inducting Trish Stratus into the uh, pro wrestling wing of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame um, more than two years ago. This is supposed to happen in 2020. Uh, Got postponed because of COVID. Got postponed again in 2021 because she couldn't get out of Canada because of COVID. Finally, it happened this year. So 
it was just as a fan, as you know, so my Mount Rushmore of wrestling. What? It was very important for me to be there to support Trish Stratus. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm sure she appreciated it. Um, (laughs) Yeah, so there was an indie show on Friday night um, where Trish did an appearance. I got to get a photo op with Trish, got to talk to Trish a little bit, gave her a business card. Mm -hmm. I pitched doing a podcast with her. She was mostly confused. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, she's like, wait, you want me to be on your podcast? Sure. I'll do I'm like, no, I want to do a podcast with you. She's like, well, well wh- what? Why? <laughs> I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, no, like, she's like, it's like, wait, you're my podcast. Yes, we would do it together. Um, I have ad people. We have, I have all the infrastructure. You're leaving a ton of money on the table. This is why you need to do it. And she was just m- mostly confused, I think. So she's like, do you have a podcast now? And I'm like, yes, it's on the business card. <laughs> so I don't think I'll be doing a podcast with Trish Stratus, mm-hmm. but um, she's a very nice person. And uh, let's see, Colt Cabana and Mike Bennett wrestled on the indie show. Maria was there. Maria was just there as a civilian. She was not on the show she was just sitting kind of off to the side of the crowd Mm -hmm. uh if you weren't looking for her you wouldn't have known that maria was there even which was unique um a lot of the old timers were there uh jj dylan um mike rotunda Um, i'm trying to think who else is jerry Jerry briscoe make it out jerry did not jerry had covid as it turns out ah uh, Wes Briscoe, his son, was there though. Oh, uh, good. <laughs> yes, that's uh, the one. She, he dates or is married to Red Velvet. Is that right? I didn't know that. She, I'm ninety nine percent sure she is married or engaged to a Briscoe. I'm not sure if it's Wes or not. I'll be damned. I did not know that. Um, two cold. I saw two cold Scorpio wrestle. Amazing. <laughs> two cold Scorpio was on this show. It was incredible. Uh, yeah, Gresh- Jonathan Gresham was originally advertised for the show, and uh, I guess Mike Bennett was the replacement. And Mike Bennett worked his ass off on this show. Um, trying to think, they had, you know, it's it's like, and then they they had your local indie types, you know, and it's like mm-hmm. you have the guy who looks like Marty Jannetty, who's like the Impact. The name of the the name of the promotion is Impact Pro Wrestling, which mm-hmm. is. <laughs> A real mind f, but uh-huh. their world champion looks like Marty Jannetty, and he's like uh, forty one years old. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but he's he's a big local hero, and Is he also uh, he, the Booker by any chance. Uh, probably. Okay. I saw him. I saw him the next day at the Pro Wrestling Museum there at the Physical Hall of Fame uh, with the promoter. So wow. I assume there's some kind of connection there, but uh, maybe family members or something. But uh, fine little indie show. On, on Friday night there. And Saturday, there was the Hall of Fame induction. The class this year was a guy named Dick Bourne, who wrote uh, like the NWA 10 Pounds of Gold book mm-hmm. that I've heard raves about, but have not never read myself. Uh, and he does like a Mid-Atlantic Wrestling History website. Um, Danny Spivey, one of the half of the skys- skyscrapers, he was not able to make it because of travel issues or something like that, which I'm disappointed about. I still want to see Danny Spivey and Sid uh, in World Tag League. <laughs> um, Danny Spivey sent in a, a speech, though, and he put over WWE for uh, getting him uh, like rehab. And now he's a rehab counselor. So that's oh, nice. Oh, wow. OK. Uh, Mike Rotunda was inducted. He did a nice speech and put over uh, his wife, who was there with him, who he's been married to for as long as I've been alive, <laughs> uh, which is no, no small feat in the wrestling that's business. Pretty, no kidding. Yeah. Yeah, Jim Ross was there. Jim Ross received the Gordon Sully Award. One of Gordon Sully's kids presented Jim with the award. And Jim Ross gave a vintage Jim Ross performance. He mentioned that he had been drinking Crown Royal. Mm-hmm. He then proceeded to give out his hotel room number. He then said that he was just joking, and that was actually J.J. Dillon's <laughs> hotel room number. <laughs> I don't think he was. Uh, I, I think it was really his hotel room number. <laughs> he um, he announced that he was not being paid 
for his uh, for appearing there. Mm-hmm. He announced that Tony Khan had paid for his travel to the uh, to Waterloo, Iowa, and they did. He didn't have to ask for time off or ask for Tony to pay for it. Tony just paid for it out of the goodness of his heart. Hmm. He, um, which I, I guess he really wanted to put over Tony Khan. Uh, he, <laughs> well, you know that contrast coming up in like eighteen months. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he said, hint, hint. His words, quote, hint, hint. He wants to call some of Mike Rotunda's kids matches someday. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> he uh, he said he loves Trish Stratus like family. And then he talking about family, he broke down talking about his late wife and uh, said that and he broke down in tears and said that what Mike Rotunda has with his wife of 38 years is what Jim wants in his life. It was very real and very raw and very painful, <laughs> very awkward. Yeah. All, but like you couldn't help but feel for it. Like no one has given Jim Ross more shit than I have. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, there, there's a like there's a line of like, I don't feel any guilt critiquing his professional work. <laughs> sure. But it doesn't mean I'm like, yeah, I'm glad his wife's dead. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um. But Jim, Jim said that there were only two prospects that he had ever scouted or, uh, or signed for WWE that he considered can't miss. And then he said even he didn't come right out and bury the company, but he said, you know, even can't miss is, you know, kind of get, kind of a guess. But he said <laughs> his only two miss uh, can't miss prospects he ever signed were The Rock and Trish Stratus. And uh, so wow. he ha- he half ass inducted Trish himself, <laughs> but uh, then uh, Luthez is the light Luthez's wife, Charlie Thez, inducted Trish Stratus. Wow. Uh, yeah, which was uh, quite a thing. So Trish Stratus received the Luthez Award, which is like their highest honor. She's the first woman to win the award. They put uh, they put Beth Phoenix in the Hall of Fame a few years ago, um, but like. Uh, not the not the highest honor award this is the, so trish got that trish gave a nice speech and her thing was uh if you her tagline for the speech was if she can see it she can be it talking about mm-hmm. how it's important to her to be uh, to uh for young girls to have role models on television and mm-hmm. um how representation is important which is always my argument for why she should be in every hall of fame <laughs> sure. in, in wrestling it's like Yes, she was. She was not Steve Austin at the box office, but and you could argue that you could put a lot of people in that spot and that they would have been the figurehead and the face of women's wrestling in this country. But the fact is, no one else was. And for half a decade, there's a lot of women, a lot of blonde women with, you know, enhancements on those television shows in those days and none of them quite caught on the way she did. So there's something to that for sure. I mean, she, she was the face of women's wrestling in this country for half a decade mm-hmm. and has not been re- regularly been on television for 16 years and is still really over. So I, th- I think she should be in every hall of fame everywhere, but yeah. And uh, yeah, so that was it. A uh, nice banquet. You, it was a hall of fame banquet and I was, uh, I was sending you a, uh, uh, correspondence and the reports from the banquets that it was going on and um i my wife and i dressed up <laughs> trish stratus as you mentioned was dressed like she was at the oscars <laughs> it was this weird mix of people who were dressed up like they were going to a fancy dinner people who looked like they were dressed up to go to the oscars and then like dudes in wrestling t-shirts and cargo shorts <laughs> <laughs> which is like I expected that, frankly. It's like, it's a wrestling banquet. There could mm-hmm. be people in spandex. There could be people in tuxedos. Does anyone dress up as Macho Man? <laughs> uh, I mean, Jim Ross is wearing his cowboy hat. <laughs> you know, there was nobody, you know, dressed as the Macho Man that I saw or the, like, you know, in Boogeyman cosplay or whatever. But right. yeah, always, always a very strange mix. Uh, so anyway... Uh, I'm not sure if I'll I I think off the top of my head, there's two pro wrestlers that I would do this for that I would get on a plane and travel for two and a half days to to go see honored. And I think it's Trish Stratus and Sasha Banks. And 
maybe if you caught me on a good day, Becky Lynch, but the list is very short. But anyway, thank you for giving my dog his hand medicine <laughs> and uh, going taking him outside at four o'clock in the morning mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and driving uh, back down to Baltimore <laughs> after going home because of my flight. Our flight was delayed coming home and it's like <sighs> There was a really decent shot at one point that we were not going to be home until late on Monday. (laughs) We were supposed to get home Sunday afternoon. And there was a more than 50% chance that we were not going to be home until Monday evening. And it was like, oh, no, this isn't good, man. Like, I probably would have tried to figure out another solution. We have other family that lives in the area that maybe Mm -hmm. I would have asked for it to do a favor. (laughs) But yeah. (laughs) <laughs> anyway but anyway yeah thanks for giving the dog his hand medicine and uh taking him outside and uh ham medicine by the way is uh the dog takes like 10 pills every night wrapped in ham because <laughs> it's, the only, it's the only way he'll take them right i i and this is a, a question to put out to the listener uh i i came up with two riffs on this process one was ham medicine yep which which ethan preferred i i also came up with medicinal ham Yep. And I would just like the listener to uh, to let us know which which uh, turn of phrase they prefer for the the process of giving a dog a bunch of pills wrapped in uh, wrapped in fancy hams. Please, please do that as a poll uh, yes. from the Twitter account and yes, with, with, a, with a full explanation. Yeah. Yes. All right. So, uh, Trish, if you uh, kept the business card and in fact sought out the podcast and are listening this week, you have my contact. You have my contact information. Let's do a show together. <laughs> She's very confused about why like she would need me to do the podcast in this scenario. Was I think the main thing. <laughs> I mean like <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to undercut your premise here, bud, but <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think she was very confused. Well, I guess like, yeah, it's a thing of like, but do you understand? If you could, yeah, if you could like play here like five minutes of like the con- one of the Conrad shows and be like, <laughs> You need a guy yes. in the driver's seat yes. who goes, day, here's the day and the date and the time. Here's what's going on on the rest of the show. Here's your segment. Tell me about it. Like exactly. You need that guy in the driver's seat. Precisely. And I need to be that guy. <laughs> no one else cares enough. No. Or would, would, I should say, no one else would care as much. No one would do it as well. Like There are plenty of people who could do it. No one would do it as well. Fair enough. <laughs> oh, we didn't talk about Ric Flair's last match either. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ric Flair's having his quote unquote last match this weekend, which is like an indie show with uh, Ric Flair and Andrade team against uh, Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal in the main event. Are you going to watch? Uh, it's going to be game time. My one buddy and I were talking about it. And if he if he uh, if he w- is, is willing to split the cost, I think I'll probably end up watching it. They got me, <laughs> you know? I'm paying my nickel to see the old freak bleed. <laughs> I have I have to watch it, so I will. But I'll tell you what, on the unintentional comedy scale, like Jay Lethal punching Ric Flair <laughs> in his surgery wound, and Ric Flair shouting, <laughs> "Ow, my surgery wound!" <laughs> it was pretty, very funny. <laughs> pretty bad. Be- pretty bad. Pretty bad. Like, if, why do you have? If you have to explain, "Ow, my surgery wound." <laughs> <laughs> also if you have a surgery re- wound why are you wrestling i don't know anyway and a pacemaker and a blood <laughs> and a blood Ugh. thinners and an inner ear thing and a foot problem <laughs> it's fine it's gonna be yep. fine yeah charlotte had a note i guess somebody asked her in some interview and she was like yeah he wanted to come off the top rope to the outside in this match and i told him no <laughs> Yeah, he wanted to do a dive, <laughs> which I think I think that's so funny because like it's Ric Flair. Like if he was like, I want to do the flip over in the corner or the the press slam to the into the ring. I'd be like, yeah, OK, I understand why you want to do those things, because that's Ric Flair stuff. Right. What Ric Flair match was there ever where he dove off the top rope to the outside like Macho Man or somebody? Can't think of one, man. Can't think of one. He's definitely taking the press slam off the top. Oh, 100 percent. I think didn't isn't there footage of him and Lethal practicing that in yes in one of these? Yeah, he's gonna do it. If it, I was imagining, I just read the headline and was imagining him doing like a suicide dive through the ropes. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, if if the guy wants to have like a chain wrestling match or whatever, it could probably look 
like I watched 76 year old Dory Funk have a match once. It's like, you know, it's not pretty, but you can do it. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's, I was trying to picture Rick doing a suicide dive through the ropes. And it's like he can't he do, he can't pick his feet up when he walks. He, like, can he <laughs> like really run? I don't think he I don't think so. You have to be able to pick your feet up when you walk. Right. <laughs> to do a to do a tope suicida. Yeah. And it's one of those things also where it's like, I feel like he's been watching Sting yes. do all of these dives. Which every, and if you look at every Sting dive, as awesome as it is, he jumps off, he lands on like four guys, and they always catch him. And even if they don't catch him, he's not coming down in such a way where he's ever going to land on like his head or his neck. Right. So like it's, it's it, you know, I'm not saying there's no danger to it, but it's pretty safe. And, he, and I just, yeah, I feel like Rick just... Saw saw Sting do that like four or five times. It's like I can do that. And, yes. And his daughter was was thankfully there to put a put the kibosh on that. Yes, that seems likely. But the WWE is, is allowing Charlotte to uh to go to the show and allowing Jeff Jarrett to to wrestle on the show. Although I guess he doesn't yeah. have any kind of talent contract officially, so I guess this is more of a, a side hustle. I don't know what I don't know. Yeah, what some people work there. Uber, and uh, Jeff does indie matches occasionally yep aside from his ability to stand up straight his heart (laughs) his blood his ability to walk he is the picture of health his ability to bend both arms (laughs) so he's got that he's got that one arm that's still all jacked up because he like tore his rotator cuff in tna and never got the surgery to fix it remember Mm -hmm. that because he had to go do the running in the hogan and uh sting match yes (laughs) In in his previous last match yes and he, yeah, he never got the surgery, so he like can't bend his one arm now. All right, um, covered pretty much. Oh, G one's happening. I don't care about that. Uh, anything? <laughs> We've covered a lot. Is there anything else you like to discuss? No, I think that that covers the the big the big monumental notes. Like I said at the start, I think the Vince stuff when it comes to the TV. Yes, we'll know after SummerSlam, but I feel like I feel like give this like three to six months, and then we'll really be able to see. Like if there's like a a big shift coming as far as obviously Johnny Gargano coming in would be a big shift immediately. But yeah, I, I, I don't expect too many like monumental mental changes to, uh, to the, to the plan right off the bat here, I guess. Yep. All right, everybody. Till next time I'm Ethan and I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Bye bye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. An important important decision needs to be made. Should, should Trey Mancini get dealt in the next three days? Who is the local Baltimore sports fan's <laughs> new favorite <laughs> schlubby white power hitter? Well, you do have till the till the second this year, so you get two ah, extra days. Okay. You get two extra days to decide. Uh, it's a real uh, conundrum, though. I feel like if you're going to trade him, you should trade him in April. Mm-hmm. I would just totally stand pat right now. I wouldn't actively try to trade away pieces. I actively wouldn't try to add pieces to this team right now. Yeah, I guess it's that's kind of where I am in the sense of like, what are you getting for Trey on his last year? And he's not, I mean, he was having a decent year, but not like a, it's not like he's, you know, in the MVP race or anything. Like he's, right. He's okay. I mean, before his Ofer stint that he had the last couple of weeks, it's like, yeah, he's batting like 280 and he's got some doubles and a few homers. And it's like, yeah, he's he's like a solid piece and maybe like a I guess there's more spaces for him now because NL teams have a DH too. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's like the, the, but like what are you getting back for him? Like some a couple single A like right question mark prospects like is that worth it or you know is is it kind of a wash of not getting those guys and you know 
signing two more guys off waivers or whatever. And, and if he walks in free agency, he walks like you're not, you know, statistically you're not necessarily replacing like this giant piece of your, of your offense. Right. There's the thing too, where there's the mutual option for next year. And when they like signed the contract, when they announced that he had signed, it was like, well, everyone who reported on it was like, well, no, usually when there's a mutual option, one side declines. It's like, well, but in this case, (laughs) (laughs) it doesn't have to be that way. Like you, you, you keep the most popular player on the team next year, if you could. And, uh, you know, I think he'd want to stick around and be part of a playoff team if we get there next year. I think maybe th- I think there's a chance both sides agree to the mutual option. Mm-hmm. So there's that. Yeah, that'd be. I mean, yeah, I'd I'd love to see him stay at least. Yeah, at least for for one like legit run at a playoff. It would be cool for you know in the same way it was for like when Marcakis being on the team for 14 was cool because he right had to be on so many, so many terrible, he had to watch Brian Burris and, and all of these other horrible pitchers uh, walk in eight batters a game for, for five years before he finally, and then got hurt in the first playoff year. It's like, yeah, at least he got that. And obviously went on to have a great second half of his career with Atlanta, but it's like, yeah, at least he got the one year in Baltimore here before he shuffled off. Right. The mutual option is for 10 million next year. Oof. It's like, is another team going to pay Terry Mancini $10 million? No, I don't think so. Um, are we going to pay Trey Mancini $10 million? Well, there's a $250,000 buyout. So you're paying him like, and he's making 7.5 this year. It's like, well, <laughs> I think that's re- I think that's a reasonable option. And you're still, and you still don't have like, it's not like you're the, 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 uh, what you call is going to be skyrocketing next year i mean that's the best part of having a team of young guys who are under their rookie deals <laughs> right like right it's still going to be a pretty low uh you know payroll team salary yeah payroll yeah <laughs> yes uh, words words are hard sometimes sure i try to keep on keeping on